So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Catherine Meenan, and I'll be chairing this session. You're most welcome. I think we're very privileged this evening to have Professor Muller with us. He's been <coughs> teaching in the Politics Department of Princeton since 2005, was previously at the European Studies in St. Anthony's, and a fellow of All Souls in Oxford. But I think the reason he's here tonight is because of his book, What is Populism?, which has been such a significant text on this issue. This event tonight is being hosted jointly with the Conrad Adenauer Foundation office for in London for the, the office for the United Kingdom and for Ireland and we're particularly grateful for their cooperation on this. So I'm just going to ask Felix who's director of the office just to say a few words. Thank you Catherine. Well welcome also from the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. Thank you for being here. It is certainly a topic of uh, the days, and um, it is quite a tricky one. So when we were approached, and um, it was, of course, a definite yes that we have to cooperate on that. Um, it's always good to be back here. Uh, we tremendously enjoy our cooperation with the IAEA. And uh, with no further ado, I think we're not here to listen to my words, but rather to Professor Muller. So I hand back to Catherine. So thanks, Felix. I could just remind you to turn your mobile phones off or to silent, please. Uh, Professor Muller will speak for the normal 20 to 25 minutes, and then I'll open the floor, which will be on the record. And then I'll open the floor for questions and answers, and I'll ask you to identify yourselves before you pose your question. So, it's not me again. Either you've come to listen to us, so I'm going to ask Professor Muller to speak. Thank you. No, I don't think you need that. that if that yeah. should pick you up. Yeah. Or, I'll get up if I may. Okay, of course. Go close yes. to the people. If of I may. course. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Of course, my kind and generous hosts could not have known this, but you might say that as of last week, we have an answer to the question how to fight populists that is much more straightforward, though not necessarily less expensive than me giving you a half hour lecture. As we all know by now, all you have to do is get hold of a video shot on a beautiful Spanish island. And that's how you really fight populists. But it's in case you don't happen to have such a video, here are some alternative suggestions. If I may, I'll start with a few words of conceptual ground clearing. What are we talking about when we are talking about populism? As you all know, our era has seen an absolutely inflationary use of the word populism. All kinds of political actors on the right, but of course also on the left, have been labeled as populists. Even, even poor Emmanuel Macron during the presidential elections in France in 2017, some of you may remember, was at one point called a populist. It was said that he was a populist of the extreme center. <laughs> Whatever the hell that exactly was supposed to have meant. Moreover, as you also all know, commentary these days is dominated by one particular image which allegedly holds the key to understanding our era. I'm, of course, talking about the metaphor of the allegedly unstoppable wave of populism, or as Nigel Farage, for whom apparently the image of the wave was of insufficient world historical significance, given his own role, put it, the tsunami of populism that, to stick with the image, with the metaphor, is now going to wash away the elites and the establishments everywhere. I actually find this a deeply misleading image, and I'm happy to tell you more about why I think that in the question and answer, if you like. But for now, just a few words on the question, what exactly is populism? Well, the conventional wisdom is, of course, that populists are those who, as the cliched formulation has it, criticize elites, are angry at the establishment, etc. Seems very obvious, but when you think about it, it's actually a very curious thought. 
I think up until recently, any old civics textbook would have told you that keeping an eye on the powerful, be it in politics, be it in the economy, be it, God forbid, at universities and in culture, is actually a sign of good democratic engagement. And come the second decade of the 21st century, we're told day and night that anybody who actually does that is a populist who may somehow pose a danger for democracy. Clearly, it cannot be as simple as that. It is true, it is true that when populists are in opposition, they criticize governments and other parties. But above all, they do something else. In one way or another, they always claim that they, and only they, represent what populists frequently call the real people, in quotation marks, or also the silent majority. You might say, that's not obviously so bad or dangerous, that's not the same as, let's say, racism, or a fanatical hatred of European integration. And yet, and yet, this claiming of a monopoly of representing the people always does have, in my view, two pernicious consequences for democracy. First, and rather obviously, populists are going to claim that all other contenders for power are fundamentally illegitimate. This is never just a matter of disagreeing about policies or even values, which after all is completely normal, ideally even productive in a democracy. No, in a sense, populists always immediately make it entirely personal and entirely moral. The problem is always immediately that the others are simply corrupt, or to coin a phrase, crooked characters. Secondly, and less obviously, I think, populists are also going to claim that all those citizens, all those among the people themselves, if you like, who do not share their ultimately symbolic understanding of the allegedly real people, and who therefore logically also don't support the populists politically, that with all those citizens, you can put into doubt whether they truly belong to the people to begin with. Let me maybe illustrate this, I think, less obvious point with two brief examples from contemporary history. Of course, you all remember the night of Brexit, at the end of which Nigel Farage famously said that this had been, as he put it, a victory for real people. Implying, of course, that the 48% who wanted to stay inside the European Union, well, on one level, aren't quite real do not properly belong to the British, or maybe in the case of Farage, even specifically the English people. If you permit one example from the other side of the Atlantic, in May 2016, then candidate Trump, in a speech which went virtually unreported, given all the other interesting things that candidate Trump was saying at the time, went on record with the following statement, I'm quoting from memory. Trump said, the most important thing is the unification of the people. And all the other people don't mean anything. I hope you can see where this is going. The important thing about populism is not anti-elitism. Any of us can criticize the powerful. It doesn't mean we're right, but it certainly doesn't mean that we are somehow are dangerous for democracy. The important and dangerous thing for democracy about populism is, for short, anti-pluralism, the tendency of populists always to exclude others, obviously at the level of party politics, less obviously at the level of the people themselves, where essentially the populist decides who truly belongs and who doesn't. And whether you happen to have an American, a Hungarian, an Irish passport, that doesn't really enter the issue. If I may, let me draw out one implication of this account that maybe is worth stressing in the connection of upcoming and more generally elections. If you find anything plausible about what I've been trying to make plausible to you so far, you may say, but wait a minute, what about, what about populist parties that lose elections? Don't they have a massive problem explaining to their followers how on the one hand they are the only authentic representatives of the people and on the other hand they're not in power. That doesn't go together. True, but this I believe is also the reason why quite often 
I'm not saying always, but quite often, populists who lose will actually put elections themselves into doubt. Or to put it more bluntly, allege that things have been rigged, that there has been fraud. Why? Because according to their logic, if the silent majority could express itself, if it weren't silent, they would always already be in power. So if they don't win, in one way or another, they always suggest that we should take another look. And perhaps what you find is that we're not really talking about the silent majority, but about a silenced majority. Somebody behind the scenes must have been manipulating things such that the real people couldn't express themselves. You all remember November 2016 when Trump, when he was asked whether he would accept Hillary Clinton's victory, said, well, I'll tell you at the time. Everybody understood, of course, what that really meant. According to some surveys, 70% of Trump supporters said if she wins, it must have been rigged. And in, term, in terms of somebody who actually lost an election recently, we've seen the same, same dynamic in Turkey just a couple of weeks ago, where President, President Erdogan, of course, said there must have been voting fraud because we couldn't possibly, we couldn't possibly lose. And I think that's worth underlining because what it shows is that even when populists don't gain power, they might end up damaging a democratic political culture. Of course, I'm not suggesting that we're not allowed to criticize our election systems, especially in the United States. There's plenty to criticize. But there's a difference between somebody who says there's a problem with campaign finance, there's a problem with gerrymandering, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and somebody, by contrast, who ends up saying, our system is rotten and rigged because I didn't win. The latter is not a democratic argument, but it basically sows distrust of the institutions amongst citizens in a way that probably is going to end up being damaging for democracy. So what to do? I fear that especially if you bring people over from the US, the expectation might be, okay, give us something positive, uplifting, constructive right away. <laughs> Sorry, no. Um, I'm going to first talk about three things that one, I think, shouldn't do. And I feel that it's appropriate to do that because these are approaches to populism, strategies, if you like, of fighting populism, which have been very prevalent in Europe in the last couple of years. And I think it might be worth spending a few minutes on what we've learned from actors who went for these strategies and who, for the most part, failed. And then I'll promise I'll give you something more positive and constructive at the very end. First strategy that I think is worth revisiting is a tendency to react, especially to the rise of populist actors, by basically trying to exclude them completely. Many of you will remember that this, for instance, was a typical approach in Germany when the alternative for Germany was first coming up. Other politicians said, I'm not even going to talk to them. If they're invited on television, I'm not going to appear alongside them, etc., etc." Completely, completely misguided. Both on a, if you like, strategic level, but maybe less obviously also on a, if you like, normative level, by, by which I mean looked at from the point of view of democratic theory. On the strategic level, wrong and misguided because through this total exclusion you are actually doing populists an enormous favor. You are confirming the very narrative which populists are always serving up to their followers. The elites never listen, they don't take you seriously, they're so worried that we are the only ones to talk about certain taboo issues and that's why they won't even confront us and so on. So you couldn't, you couldn't do better in terms of actually validating what they have been telling their own supporters all along. But on a, if you like, more normative level, there's a perhaps less obvious problem. Because especially when these parties have representation in parliaments, when they actually get in, if you completely exclude them, if you refuse to even debate with them, of course, on one level, you are denying representation to all citizens who voted for these populist actors. 
And a, I think, fateful mistake has often been that observers and politicians start to assume that everybody who votes for a populist party is themselves somehow a populist, which from my point of view means they must somehow be anti-pluralist. But for the most part, we don't know that. I mean, forgive the cliched example, but it's not inconceivable to have somebody in France say, look, I don't really care what Marine Le Pen says about all the other parties, seems all very exaggerated, but her, poli her industrial policies for the north of France, that's you know, the thing that I absolutely love, and that's why I voted for her. Of course, everybody forever now has been beating up on Hillary Clinton because of one word, deplorables. But from my point of view, that wasn't the worst, because with all due respect, a lot of what President Trump and a fair amount of his followers have been saying is deplorable. I think for me the scandalous word that Clinton used in that infamous speech was another one. It was the word irredeemable. It basically said there are citizens that we can simply forget about. No matter what we say, no matter how we try to engage them, they are simply lost forever. That, ladies and gentlemen, I think is a profoundly undemocratic thought. Yes, empirically, we know how random, how, how seldomly citizens actually really fundamentally change their views. But to from the get-go say, we're not even going to try, it makes no sense. These are lost for democracy. These are anti-pluralists. These are populist voters. Profoundly wrong. What we've, of course, also seen is the second strategy is a typical move from one extreme to the other. So after years of, of telling us that populists are demagogues, that they're always lying, they're always making promises to the people which cannot be kept, etc., all of a sudden, many politicians turn around and start saying things like, well, you know, of course, we don't really like what they're saying, but maybe they know something about what's going on deep down in society that the rest of us haven't quite figured out. Which then practically often comes down to something like, well, if we can't run from them, we'll run after them. Or, put even more pointedly, so-called mainstream politicians start to bet on a somewhat paradoxical sounding strategy of destruction through imitation. Again, this for the most part seems bound to fail both on a strategic level, but is also misguided on the normative level. Strategically, I'm not telling you anything very new, all those politicians who started to run after, let's say, far-right populists, strangely found that they could never catch them. No matter, for instance, how fast Nicolas Sarkozy ran in 2016, you know, here's another anti-immigration measure. Here's another piece of pork that Muslims are going to have to eat in school. He could somehow never catch Marine Le Pen. But what happened, of course, and this goes to the more normative level, is that eventually, if mainstream parties engage in this, let's call it what it is, opportunism, a whole political spectrum can, in this, as in this case, shift to the right in a way that arguably was never really democratically authorized by many people because they thought they were just voting for their usual mainstream parties. They didn't necessarily want the kinds of outcomes on, let's say, refugees and immigration, which by now we see in countries like Denmark and the Netherlands, which, as you know, have shifted massively to the right, so much so that, in fact, even the Social Democrats in Denmark are now trying to run after far-right populists. It's unlikely to work. We've seen so many times that citizens end up saying, look, you know, mainstream parties told us for years that this was totally unacceptable to have these views. Now they basically are telling us the same thing. You know what? The original is still on offer. Why should I vote for the pale copy? So again, a problem on a strategic and a normative level. Last thing that is, alas, rather negative, I will bother you with, is another, I think, very typical reaction we've seen in Europe, but also in other parts of the world. And in certain ways, it's probably the most tempting one. Especially liberals, liberals, let's say, in the widest sense, have often said something like, look, the populists really are those who have these horrendously simplistic ideas about policy, they're always lying, so what does that mean? That means that our side has rationality, has the truth, and as you know, it's not just politicians who say these things. You just need to click on 
certain American websites, certain newspapers, and what pops up at you every single time is, if you care about the truth, subscribe now. Strangely, the truth is always 40% cheaper on any given, on any given, uh, any given day. Especially, of course, in, 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 the fa in, in being uh, being face to face with a president who, I've lost count, you probably too, 2,000 times that he's lied by now, whatever. Um, it's very tempting to say they're always lying and we have the truth. But what's the likely outcome of this strategy? Well, it's a position that for shorthand you might call a certain kind of technocracy. The kind of person who ends up saying there's a singularly rational response to certain policy challenges, to our political environment, with the implication that if you happen to disagree with that, let's say again in the widest sense, liberal politician, well, you've revealed yourself to be probably unreasonable or irrational in a certain way. Problem here is that politicians who drive this line again actually do populists a massive favor. Because the more they insist on this technocratic stance, the more they pave the way for populists to then say, what do you mean democracy without choices? What do you mean democracy without the people coming into it and playing a role? And what then has often enough happened is that populists might do relatively well at the polls. If they do so, technocrats are gonna become even more wary of the people and conclude that, look, you know, the people are gonna bring crazy demagogues to power. Ideally, even less decision-making power for the people, which in turn, as hopefully you can see, is gonna reinforce the populists. So a kind of vicious circle gets going. And the seeming extremes that oppose each other, technocracy, rationality, truth, and populism, alleged irrationality, they actually keep reinforcing each other in a certain way. Moreover, moreover, even though it looks like here are two extremes opposed to each other, populism and technocracy actually share one characteristic. Because ultimately, they're both forms of anti-pluralism. The technocrat says, only one rational solution. If you don't agree with me, you're irrational, no need for debate, no need for parliaments to you know, come into the picture here, etc. Populist says, there's only one authentic will of the people. And by the way, only I know it. Debates, exchange of arguments, parliaments don't have to come into the picture. This is obviously an exager exaggeration of sorts, but I would claim that many Europeans might recognize this specific picture, especially but not only from the height of the Euro crisis, a sort of fateful vicious circle where populism and technocracy end up reinforcing each other. And I partly want to, make, I want to underline this point because the person who is, of course, usually presented as the great savior from populism in our era, Emmanuel Macron, with all due respect, might sometimes be in danger of precisely going down this road. He precisely might go for what you might call a second coming of the third way. A sort of attitude that says there is a singularly reasonable center which, by the way, of course, of course, was also the reason why he could say people from the right and the left can join the movement. I don't care where you're coming from. You just have to be reasonable. And for a while, the image that, in a sense, French party politics presented was close enough to what he was claiming. There was that center, and there were the crazy, seemingly crazy extremes of Mélenchon and Le Pen. But I think this is the wrong strategy. I think you're more likely in the long run to encourage populism if you go for this, in a sense, shortcut of saying we are uniquely reasonable, you just have to agree with us, as opposed to, for instance, justifying your policies in different ways, mobilizing for your policies in different ways, and so on. All right, um, finally, 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 something more constructive. What should politicians Let's stick with them for a second. We can also talk about, if you like, what citizens at large can do later on. But let's stick with politicians for the moment. What should they do? Well, as hopefully has become clear, there is no alternative to engaging with populist politicians. But talking with them doesn't have to mean talking like them. It doesn't have to mean that you accept the way they frame problems. It doesn't have to 
mean that you basically always talk about the issues that they own and that they want to talk about. So far, so obvious. Maybe less obvious is the point that when you then find yourself, let's say, in a debate, it's important on the one hand to admit that there are plenty of policy issues which we can reasonably disagree about in a democracy. Let's, you know, take a typical example in this, in this context. There are many reasonable, though from my point of view not always attractive positions one can hold on refugee policy and immigration. I think it's not plausible to say that somebody who wants to radically reduce immigration is in and of itself undemocratic or beyond the pale of democratic discourse. But if within a debate a populist specifically reveals themselves as a populist, it's absolutely crucial that other politicians mark a red line. Let me give you one example. If a populist, for instance, says, well, or suggests, well, there is a secret plan hatched by Angela Merkel that wants to replace the German folk with Syrians, it's pretty important that other politicians and journalists and citizens don't treat this as just another contribution to the refugee and immigration debate. Of course, drawing that red line is not going to practically make the populace recoil and say, oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was uttering a conspiracy theory imported from France, the Great Replacement Theory. But it's not about him. And by the way, as I'm sure many of you know, this is a real-world example. It's not about him. It's about citizens seeing these sorts of scenes. And the hope, and maybe you might say it's a pious hope of a democratic theorist, is that there's still enough citizens who will say, yeah, we kind of agree on some of the policy issues. But you know what? We don't really want to be in the same boat with people who spin conspiracy theories or in the German context who tell us that the democracy we live in now is pretty much the equivalent of the late German Democratic Republic, i.e. a pretty obvious dictatorship. That, I think, is the constructive lesson. And I think one thing we found is that even though it seems very straightforward, it's incredibly difficult to do. I think it really takes a sense of judgment, of timing, of finding the right tone, the things that ideally one would expect from a professional politician to do this well and to have the desired, the desired effects. There's much more to be said about obviously many other issues in this context. I haven't even talked about policy, which probably is a mortal sin in the context of a think tank. I haven't said anything about what citizens themselves can do, which is probably also a moral, si a moral sin if you, you know, say that you're a democratic theorist, God forbid. But I hope we can do some of these things in our discussion now. Thank you.